Ink. There we go. Now everybody's victimized with a hello, welcome to Grace Christian Fellowship twice over. Woohoo! <laughs> That's so good. Double welcome. There you go. I uh, hope everybody's got a bulletin. And I uh, just want to make point out that uh, we have a regular Wednesday prayer. Uh, definitely, uh, again, if I do not contact you with a prayer request, feel free to contact me. Yeah, the, my number's on the back there, and my email address, and, and the, 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 my number, you can text me with them something, or email me, or call and leave a message. I might not always be able to answer, but feel free to call and leave a message. And so let me know your what's going on, if prayer requests, or if there's a praise report, it's great to know what the Lord's been doing, and we share it with each other. Uh, next Saturday, boy, a lady's got it going on. That's because they're jealous of us men. Our men's weekend, we're out there shivering and getting it cold in the rain. So uh, it was awesome. It was a good men's retreat. Uh, had a lot of good discussion, a lot of the hanging out together. So uh, yay! Uh, and so, ladies of the event, you're going to go to uh, Inspire Church there, where they're going to have a, a nice, wonderful. Uh, inspirational. I'm trying to get my mind around it. Women hand in hand in bed there. It's in, it's in the fine print. <laughs> uh -huh. There it is. So, it, so they're going to go to there. And so if you have any questions about that, talk to Santa and Sarah. But then afterwards, you're going to come over, over here and you guys are going to do dinner. With, and you're going to do conversation and fellowship. That's just crazy. That's a, so and there you go. So that's going to happen afterwards. It's all next Saturday. So if you're interested in that, let uh, 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 Santa and Sarah know there is a cost for the dinner of 10 bucks, and the tickets for the event are $25. And I see that in big letters, the payment is due today. Yeah, so we need to know for need sure. Need to know. So there you go. On that note, is there anything else going on that we, that we need to be aware of that we don't know about? All righty, there you go. Well, let's pray then. Get ready to dive into God's word here. Father God, we just thank you for this opportunity now to worship you in the word. Uh, Lord, I pray that uh, you would just uh, open up your word to our hearts. Uh, help us, Father, to, to listen, to uh, see what you have to say. Uh, but most of, importantly, Lord, I pray that it would find a place in our souls, that it would... Uh, stick to us, Lord, and uh, do its, its uh, surgical, hopeful work on our hearts. And I just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. We're in Daniel chapter 10. Uh, first, really, not like the first half, but the first part, uh, first, maybe the first half of this chapter. And I have called it awestruck. 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 Uh, so, as I'm thinking about this, one of my, you know, as, as anybody is familiar with my testimony, one of my great influential events in life was when I had to really learn how to defend the gospel. And of course, uh, one of the greatest things that we have to learn and understand is just understanding the idea that Jesus Christ is truly uh, God the Son, and that he is 100% man, 100% God. Uh, the second person of what we understand is the Trinity. Uh, and so in that understanding, one of the under, uh, an element of that is that, uh, unlike, because a lot of people think, well, Christmas is when Jesus was born. And then that's, there he is. Suddenly he existed. But he, is, he has existed eternally. He has always been there as uh, John, the, the apostle, points out that the, right at the very first verse of his gospel, he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word uh, was with God, and the Word was God. And of course, uh, we know that a few verses down in verse 14, he identified who the Word is, that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So that is Jesus. So here it is. Jesus has been around all the, the whole time. In fact, uh, Paul reiterates in his little book to the church of, uh, of Colossae, that Jesus was the one that created everything. He is the creator. 
It says in Colossians 1.16, For by him, and he's talking about Jesus, by him all things were created in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. So that's what Jesus did. And of course, this verse, when we get to next week, it's going to be interesting because we're going to talk about these different divisions out there, these heavenly realms, if you will, that we just have a bare glimpse of and understanding of. But there's that there's where Jesus is part. He has done it. He has worked that. So now you're like, well, Robbie, what does this have to do with Daniel? Well, you see, as we've been going along with Daniel, uh, some of us on the uh, Wednesday night Bible studies, or, uh, but as, uh, as I've also hit here, Daniel has had secondhand and visional uh, encounters with Christ throughout his little short prophetic book, 12 chapters. First encounter, really, that Daniel would have had when his friends were thrown into a fiery oven. And because his friends, because Daniel most likely was not there, so they, he gets this event secondhand, he finds out they're thrown in, but somebody else is in the oven with them. And many people have suggested that that was Christ himself. Hanging out with the guys, chilling out in, inside the flames there, and rescuing them. So that's quite possible. And so there it is, an encounter. Uh, Daniel himself, as he's proceeded in his visions, remember he had the visions of all these creatures and everything that was going on. And in the midst of that vision, he saw somebody that was hanging out with the Ancient of Days, another name for God the Father. But he sees somebody else there. He sees this Son of Man that's hanging out with him. And he's like, who's this guy? So he has this kind of a vision of who he is. And that's, that's, that's Jesus. But you have to remember, he doesn't know him as Jesus. He doesn't know him as, as a, a play on the name Joshua or Yeshua. That's a, a good way to try to pronounce it. But they, 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 he didn't know him as that. He knew him as this whoever this person was, this person the Son of Man is what he would understand him as. It's just like, but he doesn't know. Uh, you know, it doesn't know who he is. And uh, Daniel later he sees in the heavenly vision he sees again all these kingdoms, but then he sees something else, a representation of of another kingdom. It's called uh, this mountain that was not made by hands or formed by anything else comes and crushes all the other kingdoms. Of course, that was representative of Christ in his kingdom. But then, when we get to Daniel chapter 9, he has this prayer, he's praying, and Gabriel shows up and gives him an answer. Of course, it's not an answer that he's exactly expecting. But within this answer, he's introduced to somebody. Again, he's given this introduction of somebody called the Anointed One. <coughs> so that, like... Okay, so he's getting more and more, of the, he's getting a picture forming up, if you will, of what the, who this is. But he is, he is not really like encountered him, and seen him. He's heard of him. And many of us can sit there and say, well, you know, we've seen Christ at work. But to, uh, to actually say, yes, I saw Jesus, that would be like, okay, well, that would be pretty spectacular. And so, you know, very few people can, usually if somebody says they've ever saw Jesus, it's usually an envision or what, a supposition of what they thought they saw. But to, as we're going to see, to encounter him for real is a whole different ballgame. And so in all of these close encounters, this one will be the most dramatic. So now we're going to join Daniel as he has this an unsettling vision. Now, some of this that we're going to see, you're, you're going to hear a lot of I don't knows this morning. Okay? And you know what? That's okay. Never as a Christian feel like you have to have all the answers about everything in the universe. <laughs> They're just because if you did, you would be God. And since I'm not God, there's a lot of things I don't know. A lot of things. 
a really lot of things <laughs> that, that, that I, we, I don't know. And, and that's just the way it is. So keep be ready for that. So we're introducing Jan, Daniel chapter 10. We're going from 9. It's been a few years since that vision that Daniel had in chapter, chapter 9. And uh, so now we're introduced to this in Daniel chapter 10, verse 1. He said, in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a word was revealed to Daniel who was named Belteshazzar. The word was true, and it was a great conflict. And he understood the word and had understanding of the vision. So here we go. We're, this is the preface of this, of this, and it starts out in the third person. Kind of weird, because most of this stuff has been like Daniel just first person saying, hey, this is what I saw. So it starts out in the third person, and we don't know why. We don't know why. Exactly. I have a thought that as often, because we're going to see, Daniel's 84 years old. So it's quite possible that by this time he's got a scribe or somebody to do his writing for him. And so this person then is introducing him. So that's very possible. Um, and it starts out also with an interesting thing where he introduces himself with both of his names. Uh, Daniel, which of course is, was his Hebrew name, which means God is my judge. But then this person also, as he's writing it, seems to feel it's necessary to tell him his Babylonian name. Because remember when they all showed up as, as young men, all the guys that were there were given new names. Usually names that were mocking the God where they were from, with giving them a name that's more pointed towards the Babylonian gods. In other words, they were trying to do supremacy by changing their identity. And of course, as we see throughout this, generally Daniel keeps his name. Even I think even down the line, Nebuchadnezzar called him by the name Daniel. You know, so just like it had a, just an impact on who it was. But this person reminded is Belteshazzar, which that, and that name is like he was Bell's prince because Bell was one of their gods. So this was Bell's prince. So it was. A twist on his other name, you know, the God is my judge. He's like, no, you're Bell's prince. But also, but in this reminder, it's also a reminder of what his position was there within this kingdom. Because right now it's Persia, it's, it's King Cyrus of Persia. So this is, again, the second regime that Daniel's been a part of. And, it's, and you can see the power difference. Remember, we talked before how this was the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians. But now the Persian star has risen, if you will, and they are the ones kind of running the show. So King Cyrus was there. Uh, as many of you know, King Cyrus was the one that uh, ushered and allowed the Israelites to go back to their country. And so at this point, he is still there. This, this, uh, and, and, and also, uh, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself there, Daniel, being who he was, as we're looking at everything he's talking about, this vision, what he saw, and understanding it, Daniel himself, is this is reminding of his training, Daniel 117, it says, as for the four youths, so the four youths, that was his friends, you know, like Daniel, Ratchak, and Benny, were all there, and it says, God gave them uh, learning and skill in literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. That was part of his training. Uh, and of which God used him uh, often in a supernatural way to even go beyond uh, you know, what any of their scholars, because they, they would have books on how to, how to look at dreams, all this stuff, but there was books that didn't explain everything, and God gave him wisdom to be able to understand. He said this was in the third year, so I was talking a little bit about that. So this would have been about uh, 534 B.C. Make sure you take notes on that, because just like history class, we're going to go back with all, no, 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 just kidding. You know, it's like, but 534 BC is, is when this is happening. And at this time, Israel knows that it had gone back home. It had already been back home for a couple years. So Daniel's still over here in Babylon. He couldn't travel at 84 years old to try to make that kind of journey would have been very difficult, nigh impossible. And so he decided, well, the best way to serve his countrymen was staying there in Babylon. And that's exactly what he was doing. Now it says that a word was revealed to Daniel. 
Now this is in this part where we get to the I don't know. We don't know. We don't know exactly what word they're talking about. It's unclear if this was the word that we're about to talk about in chapter 11 or if this is something else. So we don't know. It's not specified. But whatever it is, God had given him some kind of message. Is it what we're going to see in chapter 11 and chapter 12? I would not be dogmatic about it. If you feel like it is, good for you. Uh, that's great. Uh, and you might, uh, but we don't know. We have no idea. It, it, it's one way or the other. Uh, but we do know that he says this. He says whatever what he knew, whatever he saw. It says that and later down the line, Daniel also did a ten one B. I'm calling it. It says that the word was true, and it was a great conflict. So this gives credence that it might be talking about chapter eleven. Because in chapter 11, if you read it, it's just like it is, it is just craziness going on. Battles going back for power plays between two, a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. Great conflict, if you will. So it might be, but we just don't know. It might also be talking about the spiritual conflict. Because we're going to see next week that there's a spiritual conflict going on. Battle in the heavens between the, the enemy's forces and God's forces going on. That are is even happening today, right around us. We, we have battles going on around us. Uh, but in this case, uh, Daniel gets to give, be given some direct information about this battle, which is very fascinating in its own right. And it says down further down the line in Daniel, Daniel 10, 1c, it says, And he understood the word and had understanding of the vision. So whatever he saw which we don't know for sure, had an impact on him. It was bothering him, very much so. Uh, so much so that we see that he goes into mourning or lamenting. He's like crying out to God for three weeks. And it says in the, in the next couple of verses, in Daniel 10, verses 2 3, it says, In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three weeks. I ate no delicacies, no meat or wine entered my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all for the full three weeks. So this event, this understanding, whatever he saw, was stressing him out again. And as we have looked at it, Daniel was a guy who took the visions of the Lord very seriously, and most of the time, he was upset by them. And it's just like God's just... We, we, many of us, think we take a look at the dear book of Jeremiah, and Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet. If he's the weeping prophet, I would call Daniel the stressed out prophet. Because like, he's constantly just stressed out by what he's seeing. He's like, whoa, this is just crazy. What he had saw is just bothering him so much. It's, and it's, it, it, again, it's making him mourn. It's not like he's like just more than just anxious. This is grieving his heart. Again, this could be chapter 11, chapter 12. Because see, everything we're starting here is all together. Chapter 10, 11, and 12 are all really one unit. Okay? So it's not separate. It's all together. It's a gigantic, for Daniel's visions, this is the giant finale. And what a finale it will be. Because the, the details of chapter 11 are so beyond fantastic. That is just amazing to see the exacting details of what their near history would be and how accurate it was. It was just amazing. So if that's what it was, that would still, I, I'm suggesting that could have been something that would stress him out. Because remember, he was just worried about Israel going back. He's been praying like, hey, it's been 70 years. What's going on? Why are we back? We're supposed to be back by now. God, it's time. <laughs> and then Gabriel gives him a vision, says, well, yeah, maybe time, but there's, all, there's something else that's in God's timing that's all going to be happening here. And he makes them understood that even with what's going to happen, that there's going to be everything come back together, but within trials and tribulations. Daniel's like, oh, okay, trials and tribulations, that might be, okay. But then if, if chapter 11 is what he's already been thinking about, well, then he's like, oh, whoa, whoa, 
That's way more than just some trials and tribulation. This is on constant warfare, and we're right in the middle. No bueno, God. <laughs> but there it is. That's, that could be it. But now, as we look at this, Daniel, he decides in his morning that he's going to eat no delicacy. So obviously he's eating something, but no meat, no wine. He's not no good food. But what could be more disturbing for his friends is that he did not anoint himself at all for full three weeks. In other words, he's not taking a bath for three weeks. Like, I can just see his buzz. Like, Daniel, what's going on? You're looking a little scraggly there. How many? Is it two weeks? Three weeks, Daniel, without a bath? Oh, that explains a few things. Because remember, the anointing stuff would be like some cologne to kind of cover it up. It's like, oh, no coverage here. Like, whoa, okay, getting a little right. <laughs> so, so there it is. That's, but this was his focus. And the interesting thing is it says he's doing it for three weeks. Now, we don't know how long when he was praying before and, and, and Gabriel showed up then. We don't know the exact span of time. But here he's given a, a, a span of time, three weeks. And obviously these were a stressful three weeks. And that's the case that we don't know when God's going to answer prayer. And again, we know that God will answer prayer. He'll say yes. He'll say no. Or he might say wait. You know, so those are his answers. And Gabriel, uh, or, uh, Daniel here is asking about and, and we don't even know what he's asking. Because it already says that he understands. Already says that he knows. Whatever it is that's stressing him out, it's not like he's like, oh, I need answers. It looks like he's stressed out about the answers. He's like, I, I don't like what I'm seeing. And it's very disturbing. Who's in charge of this operation? Who's running this show? That might have been part of the questions. Which goes into who he meets next. Because in all of his visions, he has seen how God has an overarching plan, overarching authority, and what he was going to do. God is the master planner, working among a humanity that has a free will to do and make choices, yet God can work within all that to, to do what he wants to do. All the time. Now he's going to have that encounter. It says in Daniel chapter 10 verse 4. As he looks at this visitation. It says on the 24th day of the first month. This would be uh, April. As they've guessed by, by our calendar. And it says as I was standing on the bank of the great river. That is Tigris. Now. I'm kind of laughing here. It's just like maybe his buddy, because you see his buddy took him out to the river. He's like, probably like, hey, Daniel, it's time to take a dip. <laughs> so it's possible. So it's kind of interesting that also Daniel is giving us exacting details about the time and place and where he's at. Uh, keep in mind that the Tigris River, unlike the Euphrates, the Tigris is about 20 miles away from where Babylon is. So it's a little bit of a trip, isn't it? Maybe he had a, had a little cabin or a house out there. We don't know. But anyway, he's over there. He's up against the river. And uh, he has all these details. <coughs> and that's very interesting. So in other words, what he's getting at is he's telling us he's very lucid. See, because often people think it's like, oh, to have all these visions. People, you know, you get these folks that do drug-induced stuff. Uh, they, they'll, they'll take the peyote or whatever powders. What do they got to do to have visions? Well, Daniel did, Daniel's not doing any of that. This is just God at work. He tells him right where he was. So in other words, he is very aware of the situation. It's not like, a, it's like I have no idea. I just, I just I drew a blank. No, he knew exactly where he was at. So it's very important to understand that. So then he goes, he says, what happened? Daniel chapter 10, verse 5 and 6. He says, I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a man clothed in linen with a belt of fine gold from Euphaz around his waist. His body was like beryl, his face 
like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the like the gleam of burnished bronze, and the sound of his word like the sound of a multitude. You know, so in other words, like a, a, the crowd of the game, you know, and they're like, whoa, and it's going. What a description. This is who he saw. This guy has got, got clothed in linen, got a belt of fine gold, body like barrel. Now that, that he was like, what's that about? And that's kind of tough to say. Many folks think it's what they're really talking about there is like topaz. It's got that, that clear thing, almost like amber, if you will. So they, they have that kind of color, I, I guess. You know, it's just like, and I, I am one that's not to look into too much meaning for all these things, but it's just a description. It's just a description. To try to go further, to try to make everything have some meaning, it's just like that's when you start to stretch, <coughs> stretch scripture out to make it to begin to say what you want it to say. You don't want it to do that. It's just take a look what it says. There it is. Got all this description. And so, <coughs> great fantastic thing to see a fantastic person and just like whoa told somebody totally different than he's ever seen before obviously he, he, you know, when he's bumped into Gabriel before he never had this description <coughs> this person is completely different completely unique now one of the cardinal principles of interpretation when we come to our Bible is this one scripture interprets scripture a great thing to know is, in other words, when you're trying to figure it out, besides context, the good deal is to go and try to figure out, look through your Bible, use your cross references, take a look at the words, and try to see what Scripture says about itself, because God works that way. He does things in a circular pattern, and so you can find things that refer to one another. So here's the way to define it. One should, within context, refer to to the Bible usage of various words, phrases, or events as the primary consideration for interpretation. Okay? So that's the idea. The Bible's going to be your primary consideration. To try to look around, it's going to take a little bit of work, folks. It isn't easy. It's just like you got to look around. you got to use your tool. If you don't know where it is, boy, nowadays you can Google it and find it. You know, everybody's got their Bibles on their phones with search functions so you can find things. A great tool uh, I always use is what's called the Treasury of Scripture Knowledge. Excellent tool because it takes that, like, in my Bible, down below, if you were to look at my Bible here, I have my little cross-references down on the bottom. Well, those cross-references, just find other Bible verses that kind of refer to that. The Treasury of Scripture Knowledge is great because it adds to it many more uh, cross-reference verses to help you find possibilities of what you're looking for. So there you go. So this is the thing that we're looking at, is the scripture interprets the scripture. Well, where else would we run into this kind of description? Well, actually, in the Bible, about 500 years roughly later, we find the same similar event. And this is in the book of Revelation, where John the Apostle has his vision. Well, let's take a look at this. Revelation chapter 1, verse 12 through 16. And then I, that would be John, when he was exiled in the Isle of Patmos, he was there, and this is the beginning of his vision. He says, I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. So, so that's another thing, we won't touch that today. But then keep going. Verse 13, he says, and in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man. So, and he says, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. And the hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in the furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in full strength. Now, if this, of course, was Jesus. Jesus was there being revealed to John. So let's take a look at the side-by-side -side comparison here. We've got Daniel's vision, where he sees this guy clothed in linen. John's vision, kind of the same thing, clothed with a long robe. 
Daniel Vision sees a guy with a belt of fine gold from some place, from UFAS, wherever that's at. I guess it must have been like the fine gold store of the day. So there it is. So he's got this gold belt. And, but John sees a golden sack. Now, to not read too much of this, but I did see an interesting comment about that because the belt's around here and the sash is around here. And they pointed, somebody pointed out that a belt means you're about to get something done. When it's worn like a sash, it means you did it. Mm -hmm. thought, oh my gosh. Yeah, that was pretty interesting. I'm like, oh, ooh, get Jesus bumps there. Yeah. Like, okay. mm -hmm. And so and now the body like barrel, again, that's talking, it doesn't really have that thing, and then it talks about his hair. But for John, that would have been significant because remember, he was there when Jesus was on the mountain and transfigured, mm -hmm. and he saw Jesus with white hair and everything else. So. But he didn't go into much body description during that time. But for John, that might have been significant. Daniel said he had a face like lightning. John said he had a face like the shining sun at the, in its full strength. In other words, one of those days where you're like, you go look at the sun and you're, you're squinting, which, of course, in Washington State, that's a regular occurrence. You know, it's just like, uh, but it's just like, it, there it is. So it's bright. He uh, said so he had eyes of flaming torches, eyes of flaming fire. Bronze arms and legs, feet, and, he, and, and for John, he's focused the feet. And probably because he was already on the ground, and that's all he could see. <laughs> like, uh, uh, feet like a voice like a multitude, voice of the roar of waters. Pretty similar. So I'm thinking, maybe you're thinking, he's having an encounter with Jesus Christ. Not known as Christ. In this case, he would just be the Son of God. God the Son, in his eternally existent state, this is who he is. Prior to having a human body, this would be his spiritual existence of who he was. And in this note, I want to make sure that as we're taking a look at this, I want to let you know that there are some that don't agree that this would be Jesus. There's some that feel that this could just been another angel, could be Gabriel. The problem in my mind is like, man, the description is just lines up so beautifully well to not be the same person. Plus also, the idea, one of the things that they look at is that if, when we get to verse 14, uh, the person that's talking to Daniel says, Daniel, we were trying to get to you, but there was some resistance. The, the prince of Persia was withstanding or has withstood what was going on. And so there's this struggle. And so some people have suggested, well, this couldn't be Jesus then, because who could withstand Jesus? I can, I can appreciate that. But here's the deal. There's a couple solutions to this. First solution is that, guess what? People withstand Jesus all the time. We do it. Unbelievers do it. Spiritual forces do it. Jesus talked about it. It's just like, hey, how come you're resisting me? Paul talked about it. It says that the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers, that they might not see the light of the gospel and the glory of Christ. That's resistance, folks. Mm -hmm. And so there it is. God has to overcome that and does overcome that. Of course, then the question is, it's like, why does God, well, why does God use people? Why does God use angels? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But he does. He does. Obviously, he does. For his purposes, which I do not understand, but a great almighty God that could speak worlds into existence, uses or has his creation join with him in, in what he does for his good pleasure. I, I don't understand it, but he does. So in my mind, it's entirely possible that this could be Jesus and that Jesus could be understood. Another option, because we're not going to get to this, we're going to get to next week to starting in verse 10, because we're going to see in a second that Daniel assumes the the popular position of being flat face on the ground, which is very popular in scripture. 
uh, just, but then somebody else in verse 10, it says, and somebody reaches out and pulls him up. Now, it could be Jesus still, or if this is a problem, it could be Gabriel now saying, okay, hey, you saw what, what you saw, and I'm going to lift you up and let's, let's have a conversation and talk about what's going on. Mm. So there's two possibilities there. I am very, uh, I'm in favor of especially seeing Jesus. And part of the reason that I would suggest this in this majestic revelation is that, again, just like uh, there was a, a prophet, I think it was Haggai. I believe it was him. Oh no, Habakkuk. Habakkuk was told, shown by God what God was going to do to Israel and by who was going to do it. And Habakkuk had a conniption fit. He's like, God, you're going to use this wicked nation to come get us? That's just wrong on every, every level, God. And he was whining to God about it. And God's like, hey, I, I can do what I want. I'm the master planner. I can do this. This is what will be best for you. And so now I can imagine Daniel has seen everything. It's like, hey, we're going back to where we once belong. This should all be good. It should be you know, peace, love, and happiness back in Israel. But all I'm seeing is bad, 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 and then a little bit more bad and add bad. This is just not good. This is not what I want. This is not what should be. Who's in charge here? So much so that he's knocking on heaven's door for three weeks without taking a bath. And maybe Jesus like this is it. i got to put a stop to this to help everybody out. And Jesus shows up to have a conversation with him about this. Daniel 10.7. Although he brought his friends there. To hang out by the river, but they didn't stay for long. And De Daniel 10, verse 7 says, And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. For the men who were with me did not see the vision, but a great trembling fell upon them, and they fled to hide themselves. These are good friends. They're like, ah, something's going on. Ah, boom, out of here. You put a beaver buggy. We're going to hide in the bushes. Let us know when it's over. You know, kind of thing. They're hiding. They're running away. Uh, just... Is awesome, but and this is a standard case. You know, so you think about uh, Paul's experience when he was on the road on his way to Damascus to go take out some more Christians. God showed up. The guys that were there didn't see. They're like, "What is going on with this guy? He just fell over. He's blind now. What is happening?" We kind of hear something. Did you did you hear some rumblings there? But they didn't hear the whole conversation. Paul did. He, he got to see it all full force. And so this is a common thing. Uh, Daniel chapter 10 verse 8, he says, so I, that would be Daniel, was left alone and, I, and saw this great vision and no strength was left in me. My, he's like, I love the way ESV kind of says, it says, my radiant appearance. So it's just like, Daniel, dude, you haven't taken back for three weeks, so if you're feeling like you're looking good right now, uh, okay, <laughs> like, but there it is. So whatever he was, felt like he was looking okay, and but all that went south. You know, just like if his friends had stuck around, they would have been like, "Hey, you're not looking so good right now." That's what it's kind of saying. It's like his whole countenance fell. It's just like he's scared. Like we're going to talk about somebody turned white. It's just like that's what that's what's going on. He's like he's very scared, and he retained no strength, and. Um, which is common. Then, uh, then Christ said something to Daniel. Daniel 10, verse 9. So then I heard the sound of his words, and as I heard the sound of his words, I fell on my face in deep sleep with my face to the ground. Again, very common. Abram, before he became Abraham, when he saw God, flat on his face. It's like, ah, this is crazy. This is, guy, this is the guy that's going to give me. Moses, Aaron, when they had their encounter. Boom, flat on their face. You know, it's just like, it's just understanding. Uh, Ezekiel talks about when he's seeing heavenly visions, he's flat on his face. That's the, where it's at. Uh, John, when, he, when we just read about his encounter, he, where is he at? He's flat on his face. 
Because they, they have an understanding. They have an understanding of the great respect and awesomeness of who Jesus is. And uh, that's what they, what they needed to see. What they needed to understand. Especially for Daniel, they, he needed to understand you know, if, he, if, if this is the case, if he's worried about this, and who's running the show? Well, now he sees who's running the show. It is the awesome, powerful, almighty son of God. He's running the show. And he says something to him that we don't know what he said. In other words, this was a very loud, private conversation. <laughs> like, so, so he tells them, but Daniel doesn't record what he said to him. And whatever he said was probably put him down to the ground for the two. It's so overwhelming what he had to say that it's just like, I can't handle it. And down he goes. Being very awestruck and overwhelmed. So again, for Daniel, this is what this is who he needed to see. He has seen Jesus in so many other ways already. Seen the deliverer, seen the Jesus that would be right in there in the fire. Seen that Jesus is going to be the rock to wipe out all the other kingdoms. See that he saw the anointed one that would be killed violently saw that. Now he sees the Jesus who's the Jesus in charge. Very different vision, very different understanding. This is understandable because see, like last week we were talking to the guys, we were talking about, and then here I mentioned, we talking about godliness. And that godliness is devotion to God in a way that pleases him. And we talked about that last part of it, not just being devoted, but the, the way that pleases him. Because so often, again, we want to please God our way, which is cute. That's always cute. God's like, oh, look at that. It's so cute when they do that. But in the end, as we grow in Christ, we begin to discover how to please him the way he wants to be pleased, the way he wants to be worshipped. And we grow into that. And so here, Daniel, 84-year-old Daniel, is having a very big growing moment. Which you would think, it's just like, this is Daniel. Mr. I trust in the Lord, in, in God uh, long enough to, you know, pray three times a day in, in the face of the enemy. I can do this. I'm willing to get thrown to the, to the lions. This is Daniel. But he's about to be schooled. So he gets schooled by Jesus to let him know what's going on. Because see, when we see Jesus, this is the whole thing. And this is kind of interesting to understand. Some see Jesus as this mean, unapproachable person. It's like, they're Jesus. That's why they have everybody else. That's why often they're like, well, I'm going to go, I'm going to talk to the pastor. I'm going to talk to somebody else before I go talk to Jesus. It's like, so that's what they see. That's what they think. Or some folks, it says, Jesus is laid back dude hmm. gonna have some chill time here and that's Jesus man he's just a righteous dude and it comes, he just kind of can get away with anything because he's just so chill and so those obviously are two extremes mm -hmm. but they're there and they exist and it's like think about I was having a good conversation yesterday evening and I, and I thought about this again for this incident that said, Jesus is the ultimate pastor. Mm -hmm. The ultimate pastor. Because see, my job as a pastor, I have a job. And that is to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. Mm -hmm. That's my job. Yes. You know, there it is. Yes. That's what I'm doing. But Jesus is the best at it. You look through the Gospels, and that's what he did often. There were those that needed comfort, and Jesus was right there to be their comforter. It's just like, hey, I'm here for you. You need healing. You need that. But we also encountered many that need afflicted. It's like, come on, you brood of snakes. It's like, who told you to come out to me? And he's like, went right after them. And so just like that, there he is. He's the ultimate pastor. And so now he's having his pastoral moment with Daniel. 
Like, I'm in charge. This is who I am. Let him know. And he was awestruck. Because see, that's the thing. When we encounter Jesus in whatever way that might be, I don't know about you, but I've been awestruck when I've had those moments when I didn't necessarily see him, but I just, I know he was there. I know he interacted with me in some way. And it's, and you're struck with awe. It's like that, that he would, I'm always just struck with awe, just the idea that he would even bother. Yeah. Yeah. That this God of the universe would even care about little old me, a speck on a big planet, among all the other specks. But he does. <coughs> and, not, and so much so that he's personally involved. Knows me. Not just knows that I'm here, but he knows me. He knows you. And that is just amazing. And that's the thing is, like, when we encounter the living God, we will never be the same. I always like the expression, I got it from uh, an apologist, Greg <coughs> Hall. says, when we think about big thoughts and big things, it will stretch our minds and our minds will get stretched. And the thing is, is our minds will never go back to being the same. When our hearts and lives are encounter Jesus, he will stretch our souls, stretch our minds, stretch our hearts, and we won't get back to the same shape we were. Mm -hmm. We've been stretched. That is the encounter that I believe Daniel needed at this moment. <coughs> Especially if what we see is what we're going to see in chapter 11. But chapter 12 is the awesome capstone of it. But even in chapter 12, when we get to chapter 12, we're going to find stuff where Daniel says, but I don't want you to deal with this, Daniel. Mm -hmm. Another item where it's just like, you just keep this one to yourself. Oh, come on. Come on, I want to know. But even, I think it's precious that, that the Lord had a private conversation with him. And that's always the case sometimes. There's times when, you know what, when God is sharing something with me that he does not want to share with you guys. That's hard to know sometimes, because sometimes I'm so excited about everything he shares that I just want to share. But there are those times when he says, Robbie, this is just you and me. You and I are going to have a conversation. I just want this for you. And that's a beautiful time. Sometimes painful. But very, very personal. And he becomes my pastor. And I invite you guys always. Let, yeah, I'm Pastor Robbie here, but I'm telling you, let Jesus be your pastor. <laughs> he knows how to interact with you in a way that goes beyond what I could ever do. But to keep in mind, though, is as he pastors you, he's got to use everyone around you. He's got to use the word. He's got to use a song. He's got to use a handshake. He's got to use a moment. He's got to use that person that cut you off in traffic. That's how he's going to pastor you. And sometimes it will be the warmest hug. And sometimes it's going to be the irritating, ouch. <laughs> but that's his pastor heart towards you and I. Father, we just thank you. Thank you that you have revealed yourself through the Son so that we can have this understanding. And Jesus, I just want to say thank you for all those pastoral moments that I've had and that I know I will have. And Lord, I just thank you that you're there to comfort me and afflict me as needed. And maybe some of you today, you're just like, boy, you know, I need some comfort. I'm going to tell you, Jesus is right there to comfort you. 
He's there to meet your needs in your heart of hearts. But keep in mind, as I say that, he may see areas where you're like, oh, this is where I am comfortable. And that's where he, Jesus, the great pastor, is going to say, my daughter, my son, I'm going to need to do some surgery here and it's going to hurt. And it's going to be uncomfortable. I have to go through there. And, and that's where he loves us enough to bring some pain in order to bring comfort. Hard to understand, but I know he doesn't. And I just urge you today that if you are scared of Jesus like, like that, don't be. That fear that if you're afraid of Jesus having that way in your life, that's the enemy talking. That's your own flesh being afraid. And I urge you, don't listen to your flesh. Don't listen to the enemy. Listen to the loving voice of Christ as he calls out to you. Father, I just ask that we would hear. And I ask it because you told us to ask. In Jesus' powerful, authoritative name. Him who is there in the golden now and with the golden sash and just the majestic presence of who you are. We praise you. And all God's good to say, Amen. 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 Let's worship him once more. That's the Lord of my soul.